you know, it's a, it's a, a mainstay of law enforcement. Witnesses are important. Some witnesses are more credible than others. But the fact is, the information that these people had to provide was critical. When the FBI did conduct these interviews, it was done in a haphazard manner, in my opinion, and all you have to do is read the 201 files. And it's because of the system the FBI has. All, all communication is vertical. There's not a lot of horizontal communication. By that, I mean they don't share much. They ask questions, they don't answer them. And in the case of the interview protocol the FBI uses, the agent conducts the interview and then writes notes. So in effect what he's done is writing notes about what it is he thinks you said, nonspecific. The NTSB protocol on the other hand is much more formally structured. When an NTSB interview is conducted, the interview is taped, two copies of the transcript are typed, both are sent to the uh, interviewee, one for their personal uh, cop as one of their personal copy. The other one we want them to mark up, make any changes or corrections to, and they send it back and the investigator makes that a part of the official file. None of that was ever done. As a matter of fact, a, a memorandum was written by Mr. Kallstrom to Mr. Hall uh, within two days of the Baltimore public hearing that said, you know, I strongly urge you not to have any witnesses testify. Man, I was going to ask you, so once it was handed over to the NTSB, why didn't the NTSB uh, interview witnesses once it was in their jurisdiction? I understand in the beginning yeah. it might have been criminal, but once that was, you know, ruled yeah. out and they... Oh, yeah. Well, typically the interviews are always conducted by either the Survival Factors Investigative Group or the Human Performance Group. In this case, they tried several times to form a witness group, but the FBI wouldn't cooperate, wouldn't provide the information. Finally, out of desperation, the chief of the NTSB Human Performance uh, Division wrote a memorandum to Chairman Hall through the uh, director of the uh, Office of Aviation Safety saying, hey, this is wrong, we need to do it, it's critical, time's wasting, and never got a response. And I spoke to the medical examiner, Dr. Wetley, who says the uh, cause of death is not consistent with the, uh, with the, the center fuel tank explosion. That's right. There's no uh, physical evidence that it was a center fuel tank explosion. There's the uh, cause of death isn't consistent. And you have uh, over 700 witnesses, I believe about 500 of them claim they saw a missile. Right. Here's, here's, here's what uh, I, th I believe is the bottom line on, on TWA investigation. First of all, we had 755 people who appeared to have seen the same thing at the same time. I've talked to dozens of them 15 years later and their story was exactly the same. And quite contrary, I might add, to many of the FBI interview, written interviews. So you have uh, a large group of people who have no vested interest, who try to be good citizens and, and, and come forward and, and explain what they saw. You have the physical damage to the interior of the airplane which we reconstructed from fracture matches and and, and a lot of uh, a lot of hard work and it showed that there was no correlation between the damage to the seats of the interior of the airplane and a center fuel tank explosion and I have photographs as a matter of fact mm -hmm. chose, yeah. uh, let me let me explain this briefly <clears throat> This is a blue tarp that uh, I got at Walmart, but it's uh, laid out to scale, the exact scale of the floor of the airplane over the center fuel tank. If you'll notice, there are yellow and red dashed pieces of duct tape. Those yellow and red dashes of duct tape show where the floor was fractured, where it was torn apart. If you'll notice, this is the left part of the airplane. This would be the forward part of the aircraft. This is the right part. And again, this is only the seating area or the floor area over the center fuel tank that they said caused the explosion. As you can see, most of the damage is to the left side near the what would be the window area of the cabin of the airplane. So you're saying can you just leave that up for one second? I just want to get a close look. And you're saying if it was a center fuel tank explosion, 
the fracturing would be closer to the middle, not the exterior. Uh, it could be on either side or all, but it probably would have been all of it. And that's yeah, yeah, that's so another thing I'll, I'll get into. Gotcha. Okay? Yep, good. And then uh, I see you have something with Okay. The after, after we uh, laid out the tarp and, and scaled the, uh, the damage, the fractures to the floor area of the tank, we took the seats that we were able to verify and recover came from that area. If you'll notice, from the front of the airplane to the back, from the right side of the airplane to the left, just looking at it visually, there's no, there's no uh, pattern to the damage to the seats. Some of the seats are in, in uh, almost new condition. Some of the seats were destroyed almost beyond recognition. Some of the seats were burned. Uh, some of the seats had the uh, materials ripped off the, the, uh, the seat back and seat pan. But there's no pattern. In every other case I've investigated over the course of my 43-year career, there's a pattern to damage. If there was a fire, for instance, and it started in this area, it would have emanated from this point, and you'd see thermal damage to the seats and the interior of the airplane, as well as thermal injuries to the victims. But from front to back, from right to left, there's absolutely no correlation between the damage to the interior of the airplane, the seats specifically, and the victims. They did correlate. So for the lay person, you know, the viewer that, that, that aren't familiar with, you know, accident yeah. reconstruction, in a nutshell, just explain uh, why that picture shows uh, that uh, it, it's, it's uh, not consistent, as you're saying, yeah. with the center fuel tank explosion. Yeah. If it had been a center fuel tank explosion, the eruption from the fuel tank would have come through the floor somewhere in here. There would have been a burn pattern. There would have been thermal damage. There was none of that. All we saw was random damage with no pattern. There was no consistency to either the damage to the seats or the floor or the victims. And the victims' injuries correlated with what we found and documented as far as the, the uh, passenger seats were concerned. Gotcha. Thank you. And then you mentioned you can just hold that up again. Well, we'll, we'll shoot that later. Just real quick before I forget it. Good. So you mentioned it was your hangar. Um, you mentioned you got the tarp. You know, what was your, uh, you know, in a nutshell, your uh, involvement with the reconstruction? I was in charge, initially I was in charge of the main hangar and I set up the reconstruction area and basically it was a matter of preparing it, preparing an evidence collection and evaluation area where we uh, brought the parts in, uh, swabbed them chemically for explosives, uh, in some cases we x-rayed them initially and then once the part was identified uh, we laid it out in the main hangar and it was a fairly simple process but a lot of, very laborious but uh, all I did was take a, a roll of duct tape and lay it down the length of this hangar several hundred feet. And then as we would find, and I marked off what they call the, the, the keel line, and I marked off station marks every foot along the length of the airplane from the, the nose of the airplane to the tail. And then as we got apart, if it came from the right side back near the wing area, we laid it in the hangar in the appropriate area where it would have been located on the, uh, the intact airplane. From that, one of our civil engineers, uh, uh, Lawrence Jackson, was brought up from Washington, and Larry d developed a steel cage, uh, which is what we put the area of the center fuel tank around. Uh, unfortunately, they, they uh, didn't save the whole airplane. The only thing that was important to them were the seats and the, uh, and the fuselage reconstruction and tank. Uh, over the center fuel area. The rest they had sc unceremoniously scrapped. But Including the wings? And oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, they never notified the parties. I know uh, the chief investigator for TWA has attested to that. Now to go back to the FBI, uh, I spoke to Chairman Hall and he said that the reason that there was uh, so much FBI involvement was that they had more resources, investigative, uh, manpower, that the NTSB is uh, you know, on a smaller budget, and that uh, you know they welcomed all the help they could get because it was uh, a big uh, investigation. Would you, would well, it's a matter of his opinion. I don't agree with it. Um, the fact that uh, the FBI could have helped us out, or the ATF, which did, 
would have been a plus. But we certainly have more than one GO team. Uh, in fact, in this case, we brought highway investigators up. The gentleman I told you did the developed a steel cage to hang the parts on uh, was a, a highway accident investigator. Um, we had the resources as far as uh, chairing the investigative groups and running the groups. Uh, we had the uh, Airline Pilots Association accident investigation team. We had the uh, IAM, the mechanics. We had uh, TWA, the resources there. We had all of the resources of the Federal Aviation Administration we could possibly want. Uh, we had New York State Police who participated. A uh, detective from Suffolk County was, was uh, crucial in developing uh, some of the, uh, the aircraft uh, interior diagrams and analysis. So uh, we've had big accidents like that before and we never, we never yelled uh, for help like that. That's not to say we wouldn't ask for it. We've never, you know, the NTSBs always work cooperative, cooperatively with other agencies, but I, I absolutely don't agree with that. And the sad part is, uh, if Mr. Hall said that, uh, I guess my biggest point of disagreement is who's in charge. If the NTSB had the statutory authority and responsibility, why was it why was it relegated or, or handed over to the FBI? And, and who was in charge? Because at first, you know, they didn't know if it was a terrorist or a uh, you know a, a missile or a bomb. So, who is in charge if, if it is a, a potential criminal matter? But the NTSB is you know. Well, I, I think the dynamics of uh, uh, Mr. Kalstrom's personality was part of it. Uh, you know, he's he's no uh, he's a Type A personality, and I you know I like to think I am too, but. He had, he had FBI resources available, uh, and he decided he was going to use them because he was absolutely convinced that at the time it was a missile. And I think if you look at some of the media film footage, especially at the time, uh, he was very definite about that. And I remember uh, talking to Dr. Bernard Loeb, who was the director of the Office of Accident Investigation at the time, and he said, don't, don't uh, get too much involved in it, it's going to be a missile. And I said, Bernie, it's either one of the greatest transportation tragedies in American history or one of the greatest mass murders. But either way, you know, this isn't a building the FBI is going to need us if it in fact is a missile to put this airplane together. You know, it's, it's, uh, there's, there's a need for our technical uh, expertise. And, you know, if they take the lead, fine, but we need to help them. And, uh, you know, a year and a, almost a year and a half later, I finished my work in Flight 800. But... Uh, it's almost it's almost as if the uh, the NTSB senior management just acquiesced to whatever the FBI wanted to do, and then of course you had the involvement of the CIA, which, in my mind, that uh, uh, the animation animation yeah I was going to call it a cartoon, but it's too cruel to the animation that the F, the uh, CIA and FBI put together. Uh, CIA did it at the request of the FBI was interesting. Uh, first of all, I think it's a violation of federal law because CIA in, was involved in psychological operations in that case uh, targeted against the citizens of the United States. The information, and they've admitted it, we have all the documentation, we sued them and the FBI through four years successfully. As I said, we spent 15 years putting this together and we got an acknowledgement the CIA didn't even talk to the witnesses, let alone do any uh, field investigation in putting that animation together. If you'll recall, it was published or publicized, and within three days the NTSB said, hey, that's uh, so, so uh, outrageous, uh, it can't be used, and uh, subsequently the, uh, the NTSB came up with another cartoon. Yeah, there, there, were, there were two, one, NTSB and CIA. Yeah. In a nutshell, why were yeah. they different? Well, basically the... Uh, the CIA wanted uh, to uh, uh, portray a center fuel tank explosion. Uh, they didn't have the information that they needed as far as the telemetry or, or radar data uh, accurate. Uh, for that matter, they, they hadn't uh, uh, looked at any of the witness testimony. But we have internal CIA m memoranda that shows clearly that it was, uh, you know, they jumped to a conclusion and then they put that thing together, that animation together, to uh, support the conclusion they jumped to. It. it wasn't based on fact. What, 
point in the investigation uh, did you start to uh, come to the conclusion that it uh, was a mid-center fuel tank explosion and why? Uh, I'd, I'd say it was, for, for me it was probably uh, two or three months. And it was a combination of a lot of things. Uh, intellectually, things weren't adding up. I mean, based on my training and experience, and believe me, I've seen a lot of these things in my life. Uh, when you investigate an accident and you're doing a reconstruction of a vehicle, for instance, it's almost like watching an old-fashioned Polaroid picture develop. If you're objective and you collect all the pieces, it'll fit together but nothing was fitting together. Uh, again, I go back to the, I, you know, I'd go to the, the Dr. Wetley's office at the, uh, the morgue in the morning before I went to my hangar to see what was new a lot of times. And I'd, I'd talk to Doc Wetley or Dr. Shanahan, Colonel Shanahan, and uh, the information that they had uh, developed through their forensic investigation of the victims was matching what we found with the interior of the airplane but there was absolutely no correlation to it. Did you speak out at this time? Absolutely. And what happened? Uh, basically, I was treated like I was a, a pest. And uh, even to a point where uh, about, well, and this is a very significant point too, uh, about a, uh, not quite a week into the investigation, we were all called back to Washington. Instead of them coming to see us who were working 18 hours a day, we went back there. And. At that meeting, my whole team was there, including the investigator in charge, Mr. Dickinson, and I said, look, we planted the flag, we got things started, but we need the absolute best, best we can find. As it turned out, the NTSB sent a gentleman up there who was uh, a nice man, but not even qualified as an air traffic controller, but he was in charge of that group. And he was sitting there, in fact, he was sitting right next to me. And I said, one of the changes we need to make, because we, the NTSB is one of those agencies, or used to be, where they want you to speak up and, and, and let them know what's on your mind. And we used to do it in a, in a polite way, but we let people know when we saw a problem. At any rate, at that point, I handed a piece of paper with a name and a telephone number to Mr. Hall. And as it turned out, that gentleman was a retired NTSB senior air traffic control investigator. He was the best in the business, is regarded as the best in the world, even today. I, I explained to Mr. Hall that this is, this is the guy we need. We talked to him at home and that he had agreed to, out of a sense of patriotism to help out. I might add that the Deputy Director of Research and Engineering supported me on this. He said, yep, there's no question. He'd worked with him for years. Mr. Hall never called the guy, never even followed up on it. About two or three days later, I was back at the hangar, Mr. Kalstrom walked in, assistant director of the FBI, and I said, look, we need the best ATC guy we've got on this thing. And I said, you know, they don't seem to be doing anything. And I handed him a piece of paper with this guy's name and phone number on. Within 20 minutes, he was hired a consult as a consultant to the FBI, and I said, I'd like you to have him make sure he delves into two areas. In addition to the air traffic control, have them look at VTS, Coast Guard Vessel Traffic Service Radar, for surface radar information. The man involved did a, collected all the information, all the same information that the NTSB had, and developed it for the FBI. That information was not handed over from the FBI to the NTSB for almost a year. And then when the NTSB got it, they gave it to another guy who was uh, basically uh, uh, worked in the laboratory and uh, he manipulated it, wasn't qualified. Again, we needed the best air traffic control analyst we could find uh, and the NTSB basically came up with a fairy tale they had. What's interesting is that original data that was developed by the FBI through this, this consultant has stood the test of time. It was absolutely accurate information. And it shows a couple things. First, it shows the airplane at about 15,000 feet, doing about 430 knots, if I'm not mistaken. And at the time of the explosion, out the right side of the airplane, there are radar hits 
of an object moving in excess of Mach 4. If I'm not mistaken, that's close to 6,000 miles an hour, plus or minus. Now, what travels at that speed? Uh, there, well, it, it could have been, you know, it could have been a bomb, could have been a missile. Uh, what, what's significant about it, though, is it couldn't have been a center fuel tank. The center fuel tank in that airplane is about six feet high, and it's about uh, 20 feet by 20 feet, and it has four metal baffles in it to keep the fuel from sloshing around. We know from records and documentation that the center fuel tank had that much fuel in it. It sat on the ground for almost an hour and 15 minutes before takeoff, and there are two air conditioning packs under it, so that would have heated it up. If, in fact, that had ignited, it would have caused what they call a deflagration. Without getting too technical, a deflagration is a low ordnance explosion, speeds of less than 790 miles an hour. So compared to something that people relate to, what right. is what is a, that type of explosion? Well, it, it's like the difference between a bang and a burp. Uh, the, the, the debris going out the right side of that airplane in excess of Mach 4 was the cause of the downing of Flight 800. If it had been a, 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 a deflagration in the center fuel tank, you would have seen thermal damage to the floor, the area above it, you know, you don't have an, a, a low ordnance explosion, that's what it is technically, without thermal damage, melted metal, singed, sooted uh, seats. Uh, for that matter, physiologically, 15 of the people were alive when they hit the water. Now, I'm not saying they were alive, but that's what the medical examiner's report indicates. It's not a secret. So in the autopsy, if, if that had been the case, they would have probably found certain people's trachea. Uh, there would have been physical evidence to support that. They found none. Then you look at the issue of the, uh, the center fuel tank explosion and the uh, probable cause. At the NTSB board meeting, Robert Swain, the systems uh, investigator for NTSB, got up and said, and it's on the internet, you know, we found no physical evidence to support that the chafed wire and the center fuel tank caused the explosion, but we believe that's what happened. Now, let me ask you a question. Since about 1954, when the Gloucester Meteor, the first jet-powered passenger airplane, went into service, until today, right now, this minute, how many airplanes have had center fuel tank explosions, passenger airplanes? Now I'll answer the question I used to ask you. Two, Philippine Airlines, had a bomb that was placed under a passenger seat over the center fuel tank. So we were able to document that one. It was a bomb. And then we have Flight 800. Now, that, that spontaneously exploded. That have had any problem with the explosion of a center fuel tank. And, and was, the, was the center fuel tank uh, reconstructed? Was there ever a, oh, yeah. a test performed to see, recreate those conditions? Well, they tried to, but they couldn't. Did they explode? Uh, yeah, but they blew it up with propane. I mean, the, the, the test they did was so unscientific. The other thing that's interesting, too, is they said initially when we were going to run the, the, the uh, exemplar test was that we couldn't do it in the United States because there weren't any 747s available and blah, blah, blah. Well, I could, you know, we went out to uh, the Mojave Desert, my team and I went out, and uh, we did some explosive testing. There were a lot of old airplanes that would have been available, but instead of that, they went to Brunting Thorpe, England. And I remember a couple of days before we went, I said, okay, what's the test protocol going to be? You know, what, what did, do you have in mind? And next thing I know, they said, you're not going. You're not going to participate. And the test was a failure. Uh, you know, the other thing that they never bothered to tell anybody about, and the NTSB completely broke investigative protocol all the way through this thing, keeping information from the parties they never have done that before. Chairman Hall said that the NTSB relies on the people, uh, the investigators on the ground. Yeah. And you, you were an investigator on the ground. Right. And you were mentioning that you uh, didn't believe that it was a center fuel tank explosion. Right. So I'm, I'm just uh, asking, you know, how, how does, why did that happen, do you think? Um, well, in my opinion, it was a classic example of uh, 
they jump to a conclusion and then selectively try to to collect facts and evidence to support the conclusion they jumped to. But it certainly wasn't due to uh, uh, the appropriate objectivity that should have been applied. And, and when did you retire from the NTSB? Uh, 2010. And uh, recently uh, you did you submitted something to the NTSB? Yeah, that? yeah we, I submitted a petition for reconsideration. When I say I, my, my team and I, I was the person that signed it. And we submitted it to the NTSB. and. Uh, we didn't hear anything for a long time, and finally we asked for a meeting, and uh, uh, a couple months later they agreed to uh, to meet, and, and our purpose for the meeting was to sit down with their technical staff that had been assigned to review our petition to answer any questions, and we told them, hey, we don't expect you to believe anything we say. Ask us, we'll show you the facts, and I say that today, and unfortunately, when we met with the NTSB and thought we were meeting with the technical staff, we wound up meeting the general counsel and four lawyers and, uh, and, and a, a, another uh, staff member. And they didn't want to hear it. Did and the sad part... new information? Oh, yeah. Because they said that... No, they, they absolutely... there was no new information, they either can, no reason to... They, they, either, they either can't read or they, they're completely ignoring the facts. Can you bottom line that the, the, it's just some of the new oh, information yeah. you, you brought to them? Well, first of all, witnesses. They never bothered to even talk to them. Secondly, the radar data that shows uh, objects re, uh, being released out of the airplane's right side in, in excess of Mach 4. The absence of, of uh, 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 evidence that a center fuel tank exploded. The autopsy information as well as the correlation of the uh, damage to the interior of the airplane. The only thing that could have caused that was a very high energy event, an explosive, not a deflagration. Like I said, it was a bang, not a belch. Uh, every aspect, every aspect of our, our petition for reconsideration was based on fact, either facts that were overlooked by them, misconstrued, or completely ignored. And were those facts, any of those brought up in the hearings that they had you? No. Well, you know, the public hearing in Baltimore, I mentioned it earlier, uh, it kind of reminded me of the movie Citizen Kane. I mean, I was embarrassed to walk into this auditorium. But the sad part is we were, for the first time, required to write a script and then sit there and read from the script. And if you watch, if you watch my, uh, my testimony at the, the public hearing, you know, I, all I was was a talking head. I didn't say anything of any substance because I wasn't allowed to. Witnesses, as I said, Mr. Kallstrom sent a letter to Hall a couple of days before and said, hey, don't have any witnesses testify. So guess what? They didn't. The parties to the investigation, and in particular uh, TWA, was threatened by the general counsel of the NTSB, Daniel Campbell. And that's not hearsay. I was there. I saw it happen and there are witnesses to it. Uh, the, the whole thing was controlled. And, you know, it was initially the FBI muddled it, and then the NTSB uh, continued the operation, either through incompetence or in intent. You, how does it make you feel that you put all this time into it? Um, you're very invested in it, obviously. Um, how, how do you feel personally that uh, you, you, you know, dedicated so much time to this well, agency and you're even putting your own time into this. And well, that's, yeah, and, and that's, th that's another thing. None of us have, have had any intention of any gain. We just want to tell the truth because we believe in it. My team's made up of retired pilots, retired FBI agents, supervisory FBI agents, uh, a wonderful uh, medical team with Dr. Wetley and Dr. Shanahan. All of these people are doing it out of their own pocket because it's something we believe in. We came to this realization after almost 15 years of research and work. And I have to say the major share of the work was done by Dr. Tom Stalkup. As for me, I've been an investigator for 43 years. This is the first case I wasn't allowed to finish and I like finishing my work. Uh, when I testified before the Senate, I knew I was falling on my sword, but you gotta do what you gotta do. Uh, there are 230 dead people. They're the only people that count as far as I'm concerned. 
we've had many, many family members come to us and, and be very thankful. For that matter, we've had a few that have had some strange, strange responses. They want to believe the, the party line. And I'll be the last guy in the world to, to, to uh, criticize them. They have a right to feel they want to, but I've got to do what I know is right. And, and that's why we do it. We all feel exactly the same way. And we all decided when we put the documentary together and the petition for reconsideration, and we're working on things now too, we weren't going to quit. And I told the general counsel that, and I guess he didn't believe me. Uh, but we all feel the same way about it. It's, it's, it's a wrong that's been done. It needs to be corrected. Now, how does it make you feel that uh, you know, this is, you've had this long career of investigating police work and that uh, there's, this, there's this case of 230 souls that is, uh, you feel that is not closed. How, how, do you, how does that personally make you feel when you sit and think alone? Very angry, but the sad part is, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a political person, but the government is there to serve the people, and we did them a disservice. Uh, the, the, and, and, you know, the, there, there's so many aspects of this I could talk about, like the FAA waited years to even think about sending out a safety recommendation because they knew the NTSB's conclusion was baloney. Uh, you haven't seen any major retrofits. For that matter, have we seen any other center fuel tank explosions? No, because there have only been two. One was a bomb in Flight 800. Now, in the case of Flight 800, as I said, there's no physical evidence. In fact, even Mr. Swain at the NTS board meeting said that we had no physical evidence to support it. Yeah, well, there you are. That means our job's not done, is it? Uh, and I like to finish my job. And uh, have you received any uh, financial compensation since you retired uh, to, to, to pursue this? Absolutely not. In fact, we've been funding it out of our own pockets. Now, the, the film was, was, I understand, was uh, uh, funded by uh, Lionsgate or Epic Films. Did you get paid by Lionsgate? No, no, absolutely not, not a penny. And in fact, I've contributed significant amount of money out of my own pocket over time. Mr. Hall said that uh, uh, you guys uh, doing this for financial gain. Well, yeah, it's interesting. What do we have to gain? It's an absolute document. In fact, I'll be glad to show you my income tax or anything else we want to see. My checkbook uh, and the other guys would too. Uh, in fact, in the case of Dr. Stolkoff, he's damn near been put in a poorhouse because of something he believes in. Uh, but I, I think that's absolutely outrageous. You know, that's like Calstrom, Mr. Calstrom saying on TV, I don't know the guy, but it's sad that they wait to get their pensions and then file a complaint. Well, I've been complaining since we were in Long Island. I testified before a congressional subcommittee and told the truth. My career went right down the toilet, but instead of, instead of, of uh, having a bad attitude, I kept collecting information. We put a team together. I found five other like-minded investigators and we developed the truth. We had to sue people, the FBI and the CIA under FOIA. We interviewed the witnesses, something they'd never done. So, you know, I take great exception to that. And, it, you know, uh, I could say all sorts of nasty things about Hall and Calstrom, uh, but you know, I'll, I'll stand on my work. The only thing that either of those men, or Gold, Peter Goltz, have been able to do on television is attempt to malign our character. You know, I'm a big boy. You can talk to hundreds of people I've worked with over the years. Ask them what they think of Hank Hughes. Because what Jim Hall or Calstrom or Goltz thinks of Hank Hughes doesn't mean squat to me. Dr. St Tom Stallcup. Uh, who you're, you're going to talk to, will provide you with the specific radar information. What does it show? And Well, basically it shows the airplane climbing to about 15,000 feet, doing about 430 knots, as my recollection serves. But at the time of the explosion, out the right side of the airplane, just about, uh, just aft almost, of the, uh, the wing, their radar hits of debris going out the right side of the airplane in excess of Mach 4, which is 
about 6,000 plus or minus miles per hour. Now, that's a high ordinance event. That's an explosion that occurred external to the airplane, and we know that from looking at the victims and the interior and the center fuel tank. Well, it, it, yeah, the, the, the radar information would have been markedly different had the center fuel tank exploded and there, there been traces. They would have picked up blips of the, of, of, uh, of, of the uh, components of the airplane coming apart. But the significant part is from a chemical standpoint, if you take the fuel that was on board that airplane that I said on the bottom of the fuel tank was only about that thick, the fact that it sat on the ground for over an hour and 15 minutes before takeoff, and common sense, if an airplane takes off, is it hotter on the ground or is it cool off when it's, when it's going through the air? as far as the, the, the uh, components. Uh, there's no way there was enough fuel in that center fuel tank or enough ullage or, or, or gaseous fumes generated to have caused that. It just wouldn't have happened. Perfect. All right. All right. So